Good morning. Open your Bible to Romans chapter 7 and 1 John chapter 4. Take the little uh, memory card that you've been given and put that right in 1 John chapter 4 so you can turn quickly when we get there. And say hello to those that listen from India and Pakistan, okay? I told you we're going to kind of move around the world, and we have some friends that we met over there that said, we watch on, online in India and Pakistan. So on the count of three, just make a lot of Pakistani noise. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> you can say anything in whatever language is, is spoken there. That shows how much I know. I don't even know what language it is, but one, two, three, make some noise. Woo! I'm glad that you're listening. God bless you. And I know they say this there, hallelujah, amen, and probably amen. Hey, Would you grab your Bible and open it up and, and uh, turn to Romans chapter 7, and uh, as I said, mark your place in, in uh, 1 John, and stand with me if you would. I want to read a handful of verses to you from Romans 7, starting at, at verse 14. The title of the message today is The War We All Wage. We started that on Wednesday, and we're going to conclude chapter 7, part 3, on the war that we all wage on Wednesday night, so I encourage you to be here. But right now, let's read from verse 14 down to verse 20. I'll have you jump in with me at verse 18. Paul said, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do practice. I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Read that with me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I don't do it. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Read the first half of 18 one more time. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Well, Father, that's not the most cheerful news we've heard, but it's true. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to to deal with it. We pray that your spirit would, would lead us in understanding the scriptures today. And thank you, Father, for your trustworthy word. May we give it the honor that it's due. And we thank you, Father, for the gift of your love and your grace and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. Well, Romans 6 and 7 and 8, that passage together, all of it, is one of the most important passages for those who really want to understand the war within, the war that we all wage every single day. In those three chapters, six through eight, it describes our dilemma, where we find ourselves. And, and it, it, it tells us why we even struggle. And here's the best part. It tells us where there's hope to win that battle, that war that we all wage. There's three major contrasts in chapter 7, especially in chapter 7, although it falls over into 6 and 8. And what they are is this. It's what the law does for me, and then it's what my flesh does to me. We'll talk about that today. And then especially what the Spirit does within me. We're going to talk about this more on Wednesday night, so look up at the screen. I'll see you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Now, I'm not just trying to get more people in the house on Wednesday night. I have a long time past since I've worried about numbers. I just don't worry about numbers anymore. But I really think it's important that if you can't be here, that you look up that study online, the one from uh, chapter 6, all the studies that you got from, from Jeff, and all the way through chapter 8. Hang with us. Don't just get the Sunday morning message. You got to put all of this together. It is so important that we all get this and that we understand this. This is the part of the Bible where if, if you're going to pay attention as we go, you're going to have questions. It, it, it's, it's one of those parts of the Bible that I would say is kind of thick. It's, and I wouldn't call it a, ju a jungle, but it's like you're moving through a forest, a beautiful forest. And, and it's kind of some thick brush in there as well, and you have to pay attention. Here's what William Barclay, uh, he's not an NBA player, a former NBA player. That's Charles. But this is what William Barclay said about Romans chapter 7. 
He said, here begins one of the greatest of all passages in the New Testament and one of the most moving because here Paul is giving us his own spiritual autobiography and laying bare his very heart and soul. And he does. He does this in a way like he doesn't do any place else, at least in the book of Romans. Other books where it's written and where you see his story in the book of Acts, you can see some of his autobiography. But he wants us to know the, the, the track that he took, his passage from being a a bond slave to the law, to being free in Christ. And it's that, that's in here. In Warren Wiersbe's little book, he said this, this chapter is greatly misunderstood. I agree with him. He said, many students cannot understand why Paul deals with the victory in chapter six, and then he discusses defeat in chapter seven. They feel that he should move immediately from the victory of chapter six to the great blessing of chapter eight. But here's the deal. If he did that, There would be some people that would be led to believe that I I guess once you get saved, you're perfect. And has that been anybody's experience (laughs) where you you were saved? And man, it was all, how many of you thought you'd be much further along the line than you are right now? I I asked that question on Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah, me too. And I heard all that that kind of teaching on, well, now, now that you're saved, now that you're saved. If you sin again, you got to get saved again. You just fell out of salvation and you should be perfect. And I just never met one of those creatures that's perfect on this side of heaven. Romans is strong truth. It's it's not like sitcom material. This isn't here to to, to entertain us. This is here to equip us and remind us of who we are and wake us up to the fact that we all are fighting a very real battle. It's It's not easy stuff. But by the way, I think it's written in plain language. I don't think Paul tries to get deep in his language at all. It's plain language, but it will require some thought. You'll have to give it some focus. I mean, come on. How many of us in this room learned something that was hard, but we wanted to learn it enough that we put up with the calluses on our fingernails to learn how to play guitar? Are we put up with, with you know, just those, those hours of what is all, all the, this num- these numbers on this sheet of paper? It looks like number soup to me as you learn trigonometry and you learn calculus, but you did it and you applied yourself. How much more important that we really give our heart to understanding this truth? Now imagine this. Paul writes his scroll to the Romans. And if it was written somewhat like the, the, the scroll of Isaiah that you see on the front of the stage here, It probably, if it was about the same size characters, it would go from the right edge, oh, maybe in about three or maybe four feet. And that would be the whole scroll rolled up on a couple of sticks. And imagine this, Paul has finished that letter to the Romans and he rolls it up and he gives it to the the messenger that's going to carry it by ship all the way to Rome. And when it gets there, the pastor or the elder of the congregation says, we've got a letter from Paul. It says right here on the return address that this is from Paul, the apostle, get together with me on Sunday night or Monday night or right away, call the church together. And they unroll the scroll and begin to read. And it doesn't come with a commentary. It doesn't come with a, a side book of explanation. Paul wrote in clear terms what he wanted those early Christians to understand. And I'm sure there were times as he was reading that, and as this book would be passed around the home churches and the gatherings, that somebody would say, oh, hang on, would you back up and read that again? I didn't quite get that. I want to see it in its context. And then they would get it. Paul isn't trying to hide anything. He's trying to reveal something to us. So if you read something you don't understand, what are you going to do? You're going to back up and read it again. And maybe go a little bit further back and read it in its context. And you'll get it. Trust me, you'll get it. It's strong truth about you and about me. Look up here on the screen. I love this. William Ames, who lived in 1613, he said, theology is the knowledge of how to live in the presence of God. Don't be afraid of theology and doctrine. It's important. But I love this quote from G.K. Chesterton. He said, theology is simply that part of religion that requires brains. (laughs) Pay attention. Pay attention. Now, there's another quote. And and this quote comes from Josiah, the shepherd of Bethlehem. That's actually me. But (laughs) I read a quote that's very similar to this from C.S. Lewis. But he was talking about the importance of reading theology. I think that's important. But I think more important than reading theology is reading the one book that God wrote, the Bible, from cover to cover. 
And so this is a bit of a take on what C.S. Lewis said. He said it better than me, but just consider this with me. If we do not study the Bible carefully and consistently, it doesn't mean that we will have no ideas about God. It means that we will have a confused jumble of ideas about God that will do us little good and might actually do us great harm. That if you don't read the Bible, oh, you'll come up with some ideas about God. You'll get them from the guy down the block. You'll get them from the lady, you know, in the, the next cubicle to you. You'll get them off the radio. You'll get them off television. You'll get them in all kinds of books. You'll get them off of a poster. You'll get them from your yoga class. You'll get them from your exercise buddy. You'll get them from all over the place. But unless they're grounded in Scripture, they'll mislead you into who you are and who God is. This book rises above every other book in the world, not just in religious categories, but in the world. God wrote one book, and we need to give it our attention to the, as, as the love letter that it is from God to us. We come, we become prey for anyone who just says Jesus at the end of something spiritual. If we just say, well, they, they said Jesus, they must be Christians. And you become prey to someone like that, so study. Now, at this point in Paul's letter, talking about study, from verse 15 down to verse 23, Paul sounds like he's making an excuse for bad behavior. Look at it again. Verse 15, we're not going to read all of it, but I'm going to, I'm going to go on just a little bit further to verses 21 to 23. But, but look at verse 15. He says, what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice. And what I hate, well, that's what I do. And then in verse 18, he says, I know that in me there's no good thing, for I want to do what's good. The will is present, but I, I can't perform it. Now look at verse 21. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. It sounds like Paul's making an excuse for bad behavior. In fact, I would contend that if Paul decided just to write a little postcard of what we have from verse 14 down to verse 23... And, and we have letters like that in Scripture. you got the letter of Jude, very, very short letter. You've got the letter of Philemon. It's, it's a postcard length. But if Paul just wrote that and sent that off as happy mail to all these churches, I really don't think it would have made it into Scripture. Because the truth there sets into the context of what he says before it and what he says after it. If this is all that Paul had to say about why we do bad things, I don't think there'd be much hope in it. You got to read it in its context because Paul, before and after, he makes it very clear that we wage a very serious war with this thing called the flesh. It's a very serious battle. And he says, we are responsible to deal with the flesh. We can't make the excuse that, oh, I can't, I, I just couldn't help myself, or the devil made me do it, or my flesh made me do it, or my brother made me do it. We've got to deal with the flesh. We've got to refuse its demands, as you saw in Romans chapter 12, or chapter 6. And we've got to inhibit its, its encroaching movement upon us. And we've got to treat it as if it were dead. We've got to call it out and say, you're dead. And I don't deal with dead people. I won't give you what you're asking for. You look at verse, verse 14 one more time. He says, I know, we all know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. He said, I know the law is great, but I look at me and I am all too human. Anybody ever feel that way? I'm just all too human. I, I, just, I just feel as, as weak as a jellyfish against temptation. Look at verse 19. He said, the good that I will to do, I don't do it. But the evil I will not to do, that's what I practice. He said, I still do stuff I don't want to do. And then down in verse 20, he just said, well, it's not me. It's not really me doing it. It's a sin. It's a sin in me. Does that sound like your five-year-old just a little bit? It's really, it's not my fault, mom. It's not my fault, dad. And I didn't really want to do it. You know, I was forced into it. But it sounds to me the way Paul talks about sin. Now, listen carefully. It sounds like he's, he's giving sin like an identity all of its own. It's almost like he looks at it like a beast or like another person you know, that, that's living in us. That's not far from the truth. In fact, when, when sin is first being dealt with in the early chapters of Genesis, look at what Paul says, or not Paul, look at what God says to Cain. 
over this, this, this gripe that he has. This, he's grumbling, he's complaining to God that God has accepted his brother's offering and not his offering. And this conversation with him and God is really interesting. God says this to him. Lord says to Cain, well, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. He said, yeah, you've, you've got this beast and I, he paints this image like sin is this gnarly, hungry beast right outside the door, ready to pounce on you. But he said, you've got to deal with it, Cain. You've got to overcome it. You've got to rule over it, or it's going to rule over you. That's the battle that we're in. How, how many of you remember, and maybe you saw too, the movies um, Pirates of the Caribbean? Anybody remember those? There's one, there's only one scene that really stands out in my mind, and it's when Jeffrey Rush plays this villain, whatever he was. He plays the villain, and he's talking to this young lady who says, I don't believe in ghost stories. I love the, the answer back. He says, well, you best be believing in ghost stories, missy, because you're in one. <laughs> you, may not, you may not think much about spiritual battle, and that's exactly where the enemy wants you to be. You got to realize you are in a war. You're in a strong war with what the Bible calls our flesh. And Paul says, this is real. And we've all had those moments where, where we do something that feels like, it doesn't even feel like I did that. That wasn't me. Why would I do that? I wouldn't do something like that. But the evidence is there that you did it. We've all looked at the guy in the mirror and said, I can't believe you did that. What, what came over me? What was I thinking? The easy answer is, well, you weren't thinking. But beyond that, you've got a wrestling match with a real you. That's a two-sided, call it schizophrenic if you want, but it's another part of the real you that you have to deal with. And trust me, mom and, and dad and your friends can't believe it either. You, you see it happen when somebody you commits some heinous sin. And the first thing that the news people want to do is find the mom, find the dad, find the friends, find the teachers. And what do they always say? Oh, my son would never do something like that. Oh, my daughter's an angel. She would never do something like that. This is not the child that I raised. And mom is there just saying, no, this can't be true. And the dad's in the back saying, no, I don't know. I think he might. Yeah, he could have done something like that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, but the friends, they interview the friends. And the friends say, wow, we never saw this coming. That wasn't the person that we knew almost every single time. So what in the world is happening? Well, this is the war that we wage. It happens when we unleash that beast that we call the flesh. And we let it off the chain. And we let it run like those, I'm not pointing fingers, but those that let their dogs run free in a park that's not a dog park and and, oh, he's a good dog. Oh, he wouldn't bite. He won't hurt you. As he's chewing all the way up to the knee, he wouldn't hurt you. <laughs> so what in the world is the flesh? There's two views of it. The first view is just your body. It's the flesh that you carry around. It's, it's pardon, you know, the bluntness. It's the meat that is you. It's the, the body that you live in. And it's a good thing. And when God saw all that he created, he said, it's very good. He gave us a body to live in, but it's just the flesh. It says in, in the first couple of chapters of Genesis, chapter two, actually, it says that Adam, when he saw Eve, he said, this is now what? Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He's got a, a compatible body to mine. We're made for one another. And God says the two shall become one flesh. It, it's just the casing for us. And Jesus himself, he had a body. This is where I want you to turn to 1 John very quickly. 1 John chapter 4. How important is it that we believe that Jesus came into a literal body? Well, here's what John said about it. In uh, verse 1 of 1 John, uh, chapter 4, I should say, he said this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. I'm not talking about spirits floating around in a church, but the doctrine that comes from whoever happens to be teaching. And Paul, uh, John says, you can trace it back to some spirit one way or the other. He said, don't believe everything that you hear because many false prophet, prophets have gone out into the world. And by this, you know, the spirit of God. 
Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. That's the spirit behind every denial that Jesus was actually living in a body of real flesh. Why would he say something like that? Because there was that false doctrine floating around in that day. There were those that were teaching that Jesus, when he walked across the sand, he wouldn't even leave footprints because he was a spirit, not a body. He had to come in a body like ours so that body could be offered on that cross for us. He had to be truly human. Jesus was fully human and fully God. He had a body of flesh, but the other flesh that Paul's talking about here is the carnal nature that we all have inherited. The Latin carnem, it just means meat. That it's flesh. And when it's used in this way, it's talking about the consuming bodily passions that we all have. It's the hunger for the sensual part of life. Or the sexual part of life. Or just the sensation side of life. I've got to live my life for another experience, another sensation, uh, another trip back to the trough. But I have to feed all of these passions and appetites that I have. And they begin to absolutely control if you let them. We live in a body of flesh. God created it, as I said, and it's a good thing. And you can glorify God even in this flesh that you have. By using the hands and the feet that he's given you to do great things for him. By using the vocal capability that he gave you. It's just flesh. It's just physical matter, but to use it to say wonderful things, to bless people, encourage people, and instruct people. But without the Spirit of God that lives in me, I'm just flesh. And Paul says what? In me, just in my flesh, there's no good thing. Because all the flesh wants is more indulgence. I just want more of that and more of that and more of him and more of her and more of this just to feed my sensations. Without the Spirit of God living in me, I'm barely different from any beast. And whenever I let the, the flesh dominate me, that's when I begin to behave, just like a talking beast, without that being controlled by Christ. Th this flesh is my fallen nature. It's unruly. Let me give you another un. It's uncontrollable, and it's unworthy. The Bible says this flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not, not this body, thank God, I got a better one coming. This body will not, you won't see this in heaven. Everybody say, thank God. <laughs> Something better. This is an uncomfortable truth though. That in my flesh, look at it again. That in my flesh, I know that in me, that's in this, there dwells no good thing. Nothing good apart from Christ. It's an uncomfortable truth. It really is. It's an unpopular reality. And it's an unwelcome diagnosis. I don't want to believe that. That in me, there's no good thing. Without Christ, no good thing. But Bill, you don't understand. I'm, I'm a super nice guy. I, ad I adopt lost puppies. I'm a nice person. I'm a great cook. You should taste my salsa. I'm a I'm, there are some good things in me. But any good thing that I put before God and say, is this enough? Because this is what I can do. I can do this. I'm good enough. It's not good enough. The Bible says that's like filthy rags before him. We all, we all want to believe the best about ourselves, don't we? We, we? we want to believe that all I need to do is try a little bit harder. I need a little bit better education maybe. I get by with a little bit of help from my friends, but I, I can do it. I can do it. I just give me a little more time. That's exactly what I told the young lady that witnessed to me in the morning of, of November 9th, 1970. I said, you know what? I can't come to God like this. I got to do a little bit better. I got to clean myself up. And she wisely told me in, in nicer words than this, Bill, that's stupid. That's like saying you got to take a bath in order to be ready to take a shower. Jesus will clean you up. He'll forgive you. And that was good, wasn't it? That was good. And I know that there's some of you that are thinking, oh, wait a minute, that's not the whole truth about me. I, I know, okay, I, I, I know I still carry with me the capability of doing great things great evil. I still do. You do too. I do. You do. But I do too. But, but Bill, you don't understand. I know that's true, but this is true because you Bible students, you, you, you Bible memory people too, you've got this one tucked away in your heart. Bill, the Bible says, if any man's in Christ, he's a what? 
new creature. Old things of what? And all things that become new. See, that's the truth about me. Well, that is the truth about you. Yes, you are new in Christ. But you know what Paul's telling us here and in other places? You're new in him, but you got a stowaway on board. You got a hitchhiker. In fact, it's not a hitchhiker. It was there all the time. It was driving the car before you let Jesus drive the car. And it's still there. You got this ornery old man. I'm not talking about your dad. I'm not talking about your husband. You got an ornery old man. It's you. It's me. That still seems, even though it's dead, it still seems very, very much alive. Here's what Paul's telling us. Right now, between our departure to heaven, we're not perfect. And, and you've never met a perfect Christian. I don't care how much they claim that they were. You can point to their pride if they claim that they were perfect. We're not perfect. Paul said the same thing in Philippians chapter 3. Read it when you get home, verses 10 through 14. Read the whole chapter. He said, let me tell you the truth about me. I could read you my resume and tell you what I was, but he said, I forget all that stuff that I used to boast in, and I press forward in Christ. And he said, it's not that I've already arrived, and here's how he says it, or we're already made perfect. The great apostle Paul said, I'm not perfect. He said, but I press on. James said the same thing. Jesus' little brother, one of the leaders in the early church, an apostle, an apostle said this, we all stumble in many ways. Say that with me. We all stumble in many ways. Notice that James didn't say, you lousy Christians, you stumble in so many ways. He said, we. He put himself on the target. We all stumble. None of us are perfect yet. Paul here is not making excuses. He's just stating a reality. We stumble because we feed the hunger of a dead man who doesn't deserve to be fed another day. This is all for all of us. This is the wage, the, the war that we all wage. And you know what the easiest way, the easiest approach to battle is to run away from it or to surrender, to give up, to stop fighting it. I've resisted that urge to sin too long. Maybe I've resisted that urge all my life. I'm giving into it. I'm, I'm just tired of fighting it. That's the easiest thing now but down the road, that's the hardest thing because that comes back on you like Hurricane Matthew. It comes back and it destroys you. One, you give, you give sin one inch, what's it going to do? It'll take far more than a mile from you. My backyard is a war zone. <laughs> you that have been here, you know why it's a war zone. Go for wars, continue. I will give you no gory details. And recently, they've been gory. But I won't give you any details. But about five months ago, I gave up on fighting the gophers. When we bought that house about six years ago, walking around the backyard, I wondered, why is it so bumpy out here? They didn't tell us about the family that lived in the backyard, the family of gophers that lived back there. And they had evidently given in to the wreckage of the backyard. And I finally, I, I gave up about five months, months ago. I just gave up to the wreckage. And it got worse. And about two weeks ago, I jumped back into the battle. <laughs> I got tired, listen, I got tired of living with the wreckage. Because they didn't just want the backyard. They were starting to move up the side yards. And if I let them, they'll move into the front yards, and then they'll go visit the neighbors, and the neighbors will say, why did you let your gophers take over my yard? They track. I just got, I got tired of living with the wreckage, and I jumped back into the battle, and I, I began to fight. Sin always wants more, doesn't it? It always wants more. It doesn't just want a foothold. It wants to take over. In, in Romans chapter 7, verse 11, just flip back half a page and look at this with me, please. Here's how Paul describes another part of this, this battle, this war that we wage. He said, sin, here's how it started, sin taking advantage by the commandment, that would be the law, sin deceived me, and by it, it killed me. 
Sin deceived me and sin killed me? Well, how did that happen? Here's how it happens. You know this. You're going to recognize this. The, the Bible, the law of God, it, it identifies the boundaries for life. It sets the foul lines, if you like, baseball. It gives you the bases you run in order to make one point, one run, would bring one run home. Now, you can decide, you know, I know I hit the ball into the stands on, off the foul lines, way into the right field or the left field stands, but I'm going to go ahead and run the bases anyway, and I want you to count my run. And I'm going to count it. You know, I've decided I want to play this a little more like cricket. I'm just going to run back and forth from first base to home, first base to home, and you just keep counting my runs. They're not going to count them. That's not the way you play that game. The law says this, this is the lane you stay in. You know the HOV lane on the freeways? High occupancy vehicle? And, and you know how, you know, you're riding along in the high occupancy vehicle lane and you see your exit coming up and you're still in and, and you look back to see, is, he, is, there, is, is the man back there? And you don't see him. And so you pull across the yellow lines and you didn't realize he was three cars behind you. You know how I know this? Because I was right behind the officer that pulled out of that lane to pull over the guy that pulled out of that lane three cars ahead of him. It didn't matter that he thought, well, I can do it. The sin, sin had been identified. The lanes had been drawn. Just a, just a little bit of paint there, but it got him. And he pulled him over just that quick. Law identifies sin. And then here's where it gets real interesting. The law has been identified. Right and wrong has been identified by God. And you know what I am? I am a sin magnet. And so are you. I'm a sin magnet. For some reason, I'm attracted to the forbidden. Just like Adam and Eve were. It's the only tree we know with any text in Scripture that they ate from. God said you can eat from all of it. All they wanted was the forbidden fruit. You don't see them eating any other fruit there except the forbidden one. I am attracted to the forbidden. How many of you have ever been walking through a building or around the you know, outside of a building and you see a sign on a door that says, authorized personnel only? <laughs> and you kind of look around and have you ever reached down to see if that door was unlocked? Come on, I want to see the hands. Any, has anybody here but me? I should, anybody but by my wife ever? No, it was me. It was me. <laughs> She would never do something like that. But I have tested I, or looked in the frosted glass. What, what don't they want me to see? What are they keeping me away from? One of my favorite um, vac family vacation photographs is at the Grand Canyon. You get out of the car at the Grand Canyon. You walk to that guardrail. You look over and it's, what do you say? Wow, everybody does. And I'm standing there looking and I'm saying, wow. And I look over the guardrail and I see, you know, maybe about... 50, 60 feet, another cliff, and I'm thinking, hey, babe, and I hand the, the, the camera to Joy, and Jeremy and I climb the fence, because we, what? <laughs> you don't do that? Who, has anybody else here ever done that? Yeah, all right. And so I climb the fence, and Jeremy and I go out there to get a picture of us, you know, like right on the edge. You know, it, it was, he was five years old. He was, it was fine. There was no problem, and we're here to tell about it. What is it about the forbidden that attracts me? But it does. And, and, and Paul says, it, it, it hit me. It slayed me. It, it took me down. Sin has three powerful, powerful delusions. I want to run through these really quickly with you. The first one is it's the delusion of satisfaction, fulfillment, fullness. That's all I want. I will be happy if I just have that. It, it, it'll fill me up. It never does. Second delusion of sin is the delusion of excuse. I'll be the exception. I have a right. Oh, I know what it says, Old Testament, New Testament. Oh, I know what Jesus said. I know what Paul said. I know what Peter and John said. But you don't understand. This is me, and I have an excuse. I'm the exception. I have a right. I've got a reason for that. And the third delusion of sin is, this is the worst of them. It's the delusion of escaping the consequences. That I can do it. I've got a right to do it. It'll make me happy if I do it. And I'll escape all of the consequences. Well, the absolute truth is sin never satisfies. It never leaves me full. I always want more junk food of sin. And I'll always go back. And, and the truth of the matter is that God doesn't take any excuses. None. I will not be the exception. 
And, and the, what the truth of the matter is no one escapes sin's consequences. In Numbers 32, verse 23, it says, be sure, your sin will catch up to you. Your sin will find you out. Everything will be revealed and we're accountable for all of it. There's something in all of us, though, that we hear the law of God. And God bless you if you've resisted this lie and this, this tendency. When you hear the law of God and you say, oh, yeah? Well, watch this and watch me. And you try to prove God wrong. But the law graciously uncovers the truth about me, that in my flesh there is no good thing. Let me read a paragraph to you from Augustine's confessions centuries and centuries ago. What was he, third or fourth century? He said this. He became one of the leaders of the, of the church back in, in those years. And he said, there was a pear tree near our vineyard. Talks about when he was a boy. Filled with fruit, one stormy night, we rascally youths set out to rob it and carry our spoils away. We took off a huge load of pears, not to feast upon ourselves, but to throw them to the pigs, though we ate just enough to have the pleasure of forbidden fruit. They were nice pears, but it was not the pears that my wretched soul coveted, for I had plenty and better at home. I picked them simply in order to become a thief. The only feast I got was a feast of iniquity, and that I enjoyed to the full. What was it that I loved in that theft? Was it the pleasure of acting against the law in order that I, a prisoner under rules, might have a twisted counterfeit of freedom? <sighs> a twisted counterfeit of freedom. No one tells me what to do by doing what was forbidden. The desire to steal was awakened simply by the prohibition of stealing. My two beautiful sisters here grew up with a thief of a brother. And they watched me come home with stuff that I'd stolen from stores, probably gave them some of it. And it was exactly what Augustine said. It was the thrill of becoming a thief and getting away with it, except for the three times I got arrested, except for those <laughs> times. Thank God I got arrested. But Paul told us how to handle this ornery, demanding flesh. He said, don't you let it control the way you live. Now, I know that there's many, many writers that look at Romans chapter 7 as completely Paul's days before he came to Christ. And if that comforts them, that's nice. And I can see that it, it could fit in that. It could describe that as well. It's a nice thought, but let me ask you, do you still do bad things you know you shouldn't do? Do you still say things that right before you say them, you know, I really shouldn't say this? Do you still withhold mercy when you should extend mercy to people? Do you ever have an opportunity and, and you miss it, you pass right by it and say, oh, I'm going I'm to go back, I'm going to help them. And by the time you go back, it's too late and you feel hor horrible about it. You're, you're, you're identifying exactly what Paul said, that in my flesh, there is no good thing. So what I'm saying is this, I notice that my struggles seem just like Paul's struggles in Romans chapter seven, where I don't always do the things that I should. And I want to close with this. The one hope. Oh, I know, I know. We're supposed to save this for Romans next week. But I can't let you go like this with this big old downer on you because you know the rest of the truth. The only hope is to call upon Jesus. And the best approach when you're faced with that stuff, and you know what it is. Some of you, it's the thing you're thinking about right now. In fact, you had it on your unwritten schedule to do this afternoon, maybe. And you know you shouldn't. You need to drop it. The, the, the best way to approach it is to fight the sin that's crouching at the door before it pounces on you and destroys more than just you. Don't give in to living with the wreckage. Get up and fight against it. Declare war. Call on Jesus. First passage I ever memorized. How many of you memorize scripture? Anybody got any scripture memorized? Some of it happens by accident, you know, as you read it over and over. But the first one I memorized on purpose was 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has taken you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able to endure. And I love this part. But with the temptation will provide an emergency exit, a way of escape. But you've got to take it before it's too late. He'll, he'll get you out of it. There is no, no temptation. There is no gopher that's uncommon to man. 
There's no sin trying to burrow into your life that's uncommon. We all face it. And the way out is to trust Jesus. Trust him. Truth, truth is this. I'm going to run through them quickly. Read them with me. Truth. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. So your truth about you doesn't stop there. This is the truth about you. Thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's true about you too. And you'll love this one. This is true about you from Colossians 1.27. Let's read together. Christ in me, it's a hope of glory. So yeah, gnarly old me is in there, but wonderful, powerful, living Christ is in me. And he's the hope of glory for me. And one more, Paul to the Ephesians, he said this, I pray you will understand the incredible power of God's greatness for us who believe in him. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. That's who lives in you. And that's how you overcome the flesh. By leaning hard on Jesus, not adopting some new Christian legal system, but by living, as Paul said, in the freshness of the spirit who's alive in you. Does that sound like a good deal? That's the deal of the gospel. Well, pa Pastor Bill, I've already stumbled. Well, I got good news for you too. First John, it says, confess your sins and he'll forgive your sins like that. You confess it, it's gone. You forsake it. Proverbs, I think it's chapter 23. Oh, but Pastor Bill, I, I fall over and over again in the same way. Solomon said this, righteous people might fall seven times, but what do they do? They keep getting back up. You get back up and you run back and you ask for more mercy. Remember what David said in Psalm 130. He said, oh, if God just kept record of our iniquities, we'd all be lost. But there is forgiveness with him. There is forgiveness with him that he may be found. Yeah, my sin will catch up and find me out. But my pardon can only be found in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Grab your, your card. Stand up with me. And let's read from the memory card that you were given. Get this one tucked into your heart. You got it there? Let's read it out loud together. From Romans chapter 7, verse 24, verse 25. It is an agonizing situation. And who on earth can set me free from the clutches of my sinful nature? Really loud. I thank God there is a way out through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father God. We thank you that we are not left in this pitiful pit, this prison of sin, this old man, Lord. Would you help us, Father, to turn a deaf ear to that dead man within us, Lord, and to give you honor and to give you glory. Jesus, would you set us free? Help us to live in the freedom that you purchased for us with the freshness of your spirit alive in us, Father. In Jesus' name. Let me ask you to keep your eyes closed for a minute. I'm not going to ask you to lift a hand up to say, hey, I need prayer. I'm going to ask you to lift two hands up. If today you want to reach out to Jesus and ask him to conquer that, that flesh in you, the desires, things that would destroy you. If you're tired of the compromise, if you're tired of the wreckage, I want to invite you just to lift both hands. I'm not even looking around. My eyes are closed. And together pray with me. And let's ask God for that freedom and that forgiveness and that victory. Just pray this prayer with me out loud. Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus Christ who died for the sins of my flesh. I'm sorry for my sin, but I thank you for his victory on my behalf. I thank you that he rose from the dead so his power can give me victory. So forgive my sin, Lord, and give me your life. Live in me and help me to stand against the demands of my flesh. For your glory, the rest of my life is yours. In Jesus' strong name, amen. 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 Let's, let's worship. At the cross, amen. Did it. You have a new you inside of you. If you surrendered to Jesus, yeah, the old critter's still there, but the new man in Christ overpowers him. Let Jesus loose on the old man. Amen? Let him deal with that. Surrender to Jesus and live that life in freedom for him.
a grace and peace to you. If you need prayer, the prayer team is up here. If you need communion, and I think a lot of you this morning would love to have communion, that's what I'm going to do. Communion is going to be served over in the prayer room off to the left side of the stage. What a great day to remember with those elements. It was his victory over my flesh that sets me free. So walk in his freedom. See you Wednesday night as we finish up Romans chapter 7. Grace and peace on you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.